introduce myself first and kind of introduce my center. Or there's two centers that I work for. Um, my name is Scott Killaby. Um, I have been uh, an author for a number of years. I have about six books out, and they're all based in mindfulness, although I don't call it that in each book. Uh, if you kind of research the history of what I've done, mindfulness is just kind of a word that's sometimes used um, in, in teachings and methods and sometimes not. And it's not a particularly important word except in um, the West um, when, when, when we had to put a name to mindfulness therapy. Right. If you, if you research some of the history of mindfulness, they don't use those words. Some of the history in the East in different religions like Advaita Vedanta, Hinduism. Um, so my history has been as a spiritual teacher and an author and a speaker for going on about 10 years now. And I eventually um, started a mindfulness training program called the Living Inquiries Community. And these are, I, I pulled together about 12 of my best students, if you will. These are people who had gone very deep with mindfulness in their own lives. And I taught them the particular method that had helped and worked, uh, that I had worked with for years and had been speaking about um, all over the world. And I trained them sort of how to train other people. And then that grew and grew and grew. And now we're in 12 different countries. And we, we train people and help people on a variety of issues. We don't do a lot of online work with drug and alcohol addiction because it's a touchy subject. You know, you don't really want to treat drug and alcohol addiction necessarily over Skype, right? <laughs> For obvious reasons. Um, so we deal with people who um, are, they, it could be that they just got diagnosed with cancer, um, that they lost a loved one, that they just had old trauma resurface, they're feeling depressed, um, in, anything that you can imagine because mindfulness can be stretched that far. It's such a very versatile approach. Um, so the mindfulness training program got built and got momentum and it grew and grew and grew. And then I kind of left the program and let my folks run it. And after that, I started the Killaby Center for Recovery, which is right here in Rancho Mirage. It was like a dream come true for me. You know, someone said, hey, let's open up this center. Let me give you some resources to do that. It's like, I can't imagine a better thing to do because I had already been sharing about mindfulness for many, many years, and um, it was just the perfect laboratory to take the work that I was doing and apply it to what I think is one of the most difficult things to treat, which is addiction. And if you can, can I see some heads nodding about how difficult the disease is really to treat. Um, the Killaby Center is a mindfulness-based program. That's the word we use to describe it. It's not necessarily DBT or acceptance and commitment therapy, although those are wonderful therapies. It's more of like it was a therapy that got built from the ground up, kind of from the pure Eastern approach. And then we included a lot of somatic elements with it. Somatic elements just means body sensing and getting kind of to the core stuff that we hold in our bodies, uh, usually from childhood or something from the past. So we really wanted to build our mindfulness approach around that somatic experiencing and kind of do away with the models, I mean, take from DBT and take from acceptance and commitment therapy, but really to grow a mindfulness therapy that we felt dealt with the real issues that people with addiction deal with, which is often trauma, anxiety, depression, um, attention deficit disorder, things like that. So it's been a, it's been a great success, actually. It's been wonderful as, a, as an alternative to 12 steps. Um, we are learning every day because we sort of, again, built it from the ground up, kind of figuring out how do we do this and create a new model, at least for, new to us, um, because mindfulness is very old. Uh, we've been very successful, a, a really good high success rate, due in part to the fact that, that we use mindfulness therapy primarily and somatic experiencing predominantly, which I can explain later is why, why I think that helps so much. But I think another reason is we've learned how to integrate wisely with a few uh, things. And one of them is, for example, the naltrexone implant. Um, anybody aware of the implant? Yeah. The implant I discovered in the first year of having the Killaby Center, uh, I was noticing that some people really needed some medication. Um, I also noticed that when they would take naltrexone, they would often not take it. They would not comply with it. Um, so then I've also heard about Vivitrol. I've had a few patients do the Vivitrol. It, it worked well, um, nothing against that. It was seemingly better than the oral version. But then when I found the implant was out there, it made a lot of sense to at least try it for some patients. And once we started to integrate that 
it was, an, it was a remarkable sort of marriage between that and the mindfulness therapy because the implant, what it does is it dims down the cravings or reduces them for up to a year. So what that allows us to do is to deal with the real issues. Since the, you know, so the, the, the focus is not on drug seeking. The focus is not on my dealer just texted me um, or the liquor store is around the corner. The focus then can become on the real issues for those who are, who are, who are having the implant. And so it's been a wonderful marriage. And that leads me to the second thing that I do which is I'm the Chief Operations Officer of My Life Recovery Centers, and that's the company that owns the, the patent for the implant. And they came to me, yeah. The, it's, it's either three months up to a year, depending on which version that you get. Yeah. My Life Recovery Centers came into being about a year and a half ago as a way they wanted to really disrupt the market and, and come in in a big way and, and help um, addicts who, especially opiates and alcohol addicts, who weren't getting um, that long-term recovery. They weren't getting the, what they really needed. This is their philosophy. They wanted to bring this implant into the market and work through the FDA process and then add a, a behavioral health component. And they wanted to use my mindfulness therapy along with a few other components to build an IOP. So I came on board with my, uh, with my life to develop their IOP nationally and, and oversee their billing but then I quickly moved to chief operations just so that we could kind of move things along and build that company. So that's a nice marriage that's happening for me in my life because there's one thing that I've learned in this industry is, and this is just for me, is that you can't remain narrow-minded about this. Um, we all are attached to certain ideas, right? And, and, and we're all guilty of it to a certain degree. And I think it's also very, very dangerous to be attached to an idea, especially if the idea cannot help everybody. So one thing that I've taught my facilitators is to understand that yes, mindfulness is wonderful, it's, it's, it's absolutely, but even it has limitations. You know, 12 step, wonderful, but it has limitations. Cognitive behavioral therapy, wonderful in certain situations, it has limitations. The implant, great, wonderful, and it has limitations. So the idea that I'm trying to work with here in the, in the addiction industry is the idea of breaking down those walls between ideas and categories so that we can wisely integrate things and really help people in a new way. And so I'm trying to bring on board people who understand wise integration, who understand that you know, the highest perspectives can be brought together, the highest perspectives in behavioral health, the highest perspectives in, in medicine, and to join those together in a, in a safe and effective way to truly uh, treat addiction in a new way. So I'm really excited about those marriages that are happening between those two entities. Um, it allows me to have this platform of creativity to, to bring what, this organic mindfulness that I created with another really, really uh, powerful treatment, which is the implant. Back just a little bit about our facilitator training program. I'm trying to set the stage for what I'm about to talk about in terms of our modality. The facilitator training program did not happen as like I sat in bed one night and said, I'm going to create a training program. What happened is that I was working with people. I've now worked with about 10,000 people in private and group session. I used to tour the world. I would go over to England. I would go to Canada. I would go to the different states um, and do these talks with people who were suffering and who had, who had, in many cases, they had exhausted a lot of the Western therapies. They got to the place where they're often anti-medication. They were anti-Western therapy, not necessarily because the, 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 all of Western therapy and all of uh, Western medication was bad. It's just that they had not found what they needed in those places. And they were, these were really desperate people who had sort of leaned or, or gravitated towards the Eastern approaches to try to find some sense of healing that would be different. So these people would come to my talks and, you know, through the, and, and I'll, I'll tell you how I became a teacher in the first place because that was another thing that wasn't planned. But they would come to my talks and they, they would want to know, is there another way? Is there another way than simply retelling my story over and over again to somebody who listens? Is there another way to, rather than just teaching me a new way to think? Is there another way that I can learn how to be with my experience um, in a way that's even more loving and accepting? And of course the answer is yes, that's what mindfulness is all about. So they were attracted to that approach. And once I knew that, that it's like people don't know they want mindfulness until they try it. 
it's like you have to really show them that because, in, and this goes back to how we're raised here in the West. I think, well, this wonderful story that John Francois told me this morning, and I'm going to butcher this, okay? So, but I got to tell this because it so sums up how we're, how we're born and raised here in the West and why I think it's a bit insane. Um, I wish you would just get up and tell the story, John Francois. Actually, would you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I've never heard a better story that sums up why I got into mindfulness. I've never heard a better story than, and I just heard that, I just met him today, and he has a treatment center in Hawaii that's very in alignment with what we do. And I have to, that's, I'm probably going to share that story a lot, like that's in different story. talks. Yeah, because I've, I've tried to explain to people who, who, who are not familiar with mindfulness practice just how powerful it can be. And the way that I end up explaining it without the story, because the story is very powerful. When you tell something in story form, it's very powerful to get a point across. But if I can just explain it in a different way, is that when I was a kid, it, wasn't, it was not okay to cry. I, I got the message that it wasn't okay to cry um, in different ways. It wasn't okay to be angry. It wasn't okay to feel shame, to feel embarrassed. I got that message in so many different ways um, from so many different, even unspoken cues, like just society in general tells you that it's not okay to be yourself, right? And what I mean to be ourselves is that we are human beings with, emotional, with emotions. 
We are emotional beings. Um, and so when I was a kid, it wasn't okay. And my mom and dad loved me to death. I mean, they really, really loved me, but they didn't know how to love me that way. And that's the difference. Um, they gave me things and they told me that they loved me and they were affectionate, which was wonderful. But what I needed to do is to be able to learn how to embrace and be accepting of my emotional experience in a very no uh, naked and raw way. Because without that, I grew up as an addict. And I, I make a direct correlation there. Because what I learned early on that it's not okay to feel, and if you're a boy, there's a certain, that's a certain s different set of rules for boys. You know, even, it, we're all getting the same conditioning. But for boys, we're especially not to show vulnerability, sadness as a kid. And the older you get as a boy, the less that's okay. Okay, and, all, and women have their own conditioning and societal influence there. But, and I had no idea how destructive that was, the way that I was being raised, and the way my parents raised their, their kids, and so on and so I had no idea, because I was just born into this world, you know? I didn't have a choice about how humans were raising their babies. I was just being raised in a certain way. And somewhere along the, the, the way, I got a very strong message that it was not okay to feel, and by the way, nobody taught me how to feel. It's not, it's not just that it wasn't okay to, cry or be shameful, but even when that was there, nobody taught me what, what was being taught by that father to that son. And that message and that lesson happened without the father saying any words. And so, you know, it's like mindfulness is the most transformative thing that you can have without ever saying a word, you know? And that's powerful because we are a wordy culture, you know? <laughs> Right? We got words for everything. We got labels for everything. Everything is put into a box. This is what you are. Your diagnosis is this. You're an addict. You're a depressed person. And here's the protocol for that. And here's the protocol for that. And here's your file and all that. And it's like, where did we lose touch with who we are? Like, where did we lose touch with the fact that what, what most of us are experiencing is just being a human with having emotions and thoughts that we need to learn how to be more loving and accepting of? And so that's why I was so attracted to mindfulness. Just to give you a short story, the way that that came down for me is when I was growing up gay, I didn't know I was gay, but I knew that I was different. Um, and in sixth grade, the other, I was also an athlete, so it was this strange mix of like, you're a really good athlete, but you're also gay, and you're feminine. And how do those two things work together? Um, they don't very well. <laughs> and the other boys let me know that. You know, so when I was the good athlete or I was, you know, the point guard on the team or the, the shortstop, that was great. But when I was the artistic, sensitive kid who wanted to express himself, that's not okay. Um, and so I got bullied in sixth grade by my peers, not just by strangers walking down the street, but by my, my very peer group, absolutely um, alienated me, physically hit me, um, ignored me, ridiculed me, isolated, ostracized me. From, and I, I actually took two months off of school, and I was hiding. I was so scared. The vivid memory of me walking into my, it, walking into the restroom, having to go to school that day, and there I was going to the bathroom, and, and just being overwhelmed with fear of like, I can't go back to school. There's no way. And then right there, I just thought, well, I'll just fake an illness. You know, I'll just tell my mom that it hurts when I pee. And, and, and so they'll be, she'll take me to the doctor, and hopefully he won't notice that I'm faking it. And then I got two months of reprieve from the constant abuse. Um, and then, you know, it's not a coincidence that only a short time after I found tobacco, and I found alcohol and marijuana, and it fit me just fine. And they were definitely genetic. I have, I have a whole family of, of addicts, so there was that too. But it was certainly all the societal or, or um, the environmental recipe was there for me uh, because trauma is often so connected to addiction. So, you know, back then I didn't have the consciousness to understand that the reason that I liked to, to use tobacco is because it made me feel safe. It made me feel like I, I could disconnect from human beings and I could just connect with the tobacco. Um, so it took the place of that relationship that I had lost in those relationships or that connection I had lost in those relationships. Um, and then I could alter my mind with mar marijuana and instantly be in a different reality, laughing and cutting up or just chilling out and freaking out or whatever. Um, or alcohol to numb out. You know, what a way to become present, just drink a bunch. 
you know, then you're like right here. That's all that's happening. Is the, the past isn't here. You know, who cares about all the things that happened? Um, but of course, that spiraled and spiraled and spiraled until I was taking handfuls of painkillers in my 20s, and, and then I would take you know, I would take like 10 painkillers, and then I, and then I would turn yellow, um, jaundiced, and then I would take 10 more, and then 10 more, and you know, I'd get a, ni a bottle of 90, with and, and they'd be done easily within two or three days. Um, all very much, I think, stemming back both to genetics, but also to what happened to me and to my, my inability or, or um, lack of, of wisdom around how to deal with my emotional life, really. Um, so when I got clean, which was after a lot of different stuff that happened, <laughs> as we all have those addictive histories, which I won't go into, um, I was three years into pra as a practicing attorney in Indiana and I sat at my desk and I opened my, this drawer and there was one pill left and I, I had one of those moments where it's like that one pill is not going to do it and you could give me a thousand as they say in 12 step and that's not going to do it. So I got clean and I was a 12 stepper for a while and, and frankly I, even though I'm mindfulness and non 12 step, I am not anti 12 step because that actually helped me a lot in the beginning to support the steps. But for me, I had to deal, I had to learn how, I had to find something that could allow me to go much deeper into my experience. I was just one of those people who needed to go deeper. I was a, kind of a, tr a truth seeker, if you would, a spiritual seeker. And so I knew that the way that I have been operating on this earth can't be the way that one has to operate on this earth. You know, like... You feel something, you hide it, you don't express it. This is how I was. Feel something, hide it, don't express it. Stuff it down. Pretend like everything's okay. Maybe eat some sugar, drink some coffee, do, do some drugs, move on. You know, and then when I got off the drugs and alcohol, it was really the same thing. It was just with caffeine or, or some other addiction. Uh, I knew that something was off. And so what I needed was somebody. I didn't know what I needed until I found mindfulness. I often say this about mindfulness. People don't know that they want it until they understand what it is. And that's the big challenge, the PR, with mindfulness, because people are like, well, that seems like you have to do a lot of meditation. It seems like it's so challenging to be mindful. But once you get into it, the, I can just tell you this, the, there's profound peace, profound peace, like the peace that the mind can't even understand. It's a peace that you can't understand. You can't get there through thinking. Um, and I had no idea that I wanted that peace. And I found that peace, and I became a diligent student of mindfulness, um, not just meditating, but also bringing that practice of, and I'll explain what it is in a second, um, bringing that practice of, even into the practice of law, like being mindful even during the day, uh, learning how to be with my feelings differently. And as a result of that, I had a very tremendous shift um, experience about 10 years ago um, in which it was like everything went quiet. All the stuff, you know, that we have in our minds just went for me. And then it's almost like it never came back in the same way after that. Thinking still happens for me, but the, the turmoil of the mind has not been back since for 10 years. Not that I've had, I have had certain moments when old traumas come up or something, I've got to deal with that. But for the most part, so, you know, this was deeply, deeply transformative. I had no idea that it was even possible. No idea before that moment that that kind of transformation could happen. So I knew then that, that um, and then as a result of that, certain behaviors started to fall away in time. So eventually this addiction fell away, and then that addiction fell away, and then that one. And it, what was so different about mindfulness, which I think is the critical thing to share, what I find is when people go deep with mindfulness, it's very different than holding back the dam, okay? Holding back the dam is the energy that you feel around people who don't have a very stable recovery, especially in the first five years, sometimes even after 20 years, frankly, where you feel like at any moment in time, they could just go out and drink and the whole life would just crash. You know, and they're just holding back the dam, like, I hope that I can't make that, it can't happen because if I take one drink, alcohol is really bad, my whole life is gonna go like that. And then it's like all that energy, right? It, with mindfulness, it's not like that at all. Um, you let the dam come through. You let the whole damn dam come through. 
and you feel everything and you observe everything and you, you observe and you, and you just let it all come through and wash through you so that the fear of the dam breaking is no longer there. So what, how that translated for me is that um, I don't walk around saying I have 12 years clean, 13 years clean. I don't do that. It, it's, it's, the reason that I don't do that is not because I don't, I'm not proud of that, because that's wonderful. It's because it's not really what my recovery is about. My recovery is, is using the mindfulness to be present to the moment and to what's happening here in my real-time experience, letting that be exactly as it is, and just living from that place. So it's not a story that I've been in recovery for 12 years, or that I'm, it's not that for me. That's not my recovery. I'm not holding back the dam. I, you know, I, when I go sit, if I travel around still, if I see a bar, I'm not going, oh shoot, I can't drink. I'm not doing that. Um, and that's what I want for everybody. <laughs> Because I just think it's a much more powerful recovery when, you, when, when you're... There's a certain point in mindfulness when you take it really deep. And I'm going to talk about what mindfulness is in a second, okay? Sorry. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the whole subject, as you can tell. Um, there's a certain point in mindfulness when you take it deeply that your body and your mind just simply doesn't want that stuff. And it's not even a decision. It's almost like an intuitive, somatic thing. It's almost like your body says, do not put that in there. Um, it's, almost, you know, it's not even a decision to stay clean. It's like uh, even taking NyQuil. It's like, I don't want to take NyQuil, you know, just because I don't want to alter my state. That's what I want for everybody. That's how I'd love to redefine recovery for people. Instead of, I've, and I don't want to make anybody upset. I'm not here to make anybody upset. But I think we can move beyond, hey, I've got six years clean. Hey, I've got seven years clean. And instead, how about just being a human being and being able to feel everything and be aware of everything and not hanging on to that? You know, and again, I'll just leave that alone, but I don't want to throw that out there as a possibility in recovery through mindfulness. What is mindfulness? It's really, be, I, one way to talk about it is becoming adept, even though none of the words quite fit, becoming adept at present moment awareness. Um, present moment awareness. How many have a mindfulness practice here of some sorts? So you know, many of you know what I'm talking about. Present moment awareness is just that. It's, it's being in a, in a state of observing what comes and goes within your awareness. So it could be the thoughts that come and go. It could be the emotions or sensations that come and go. It could be the sounds in the room. It could be whatever it is. But but the, the key is how you relate to those things. So normally when a thought comes through, the way we're conditioned is a thought comes through and you gotta deal with it because you think it's true, right? Like my mom does this to me always. And, it's, you know, and then you're trying to add other thoughts to it to try to make sense of why she does that. Um, and then you're feeling all these emotions then you, and then the emotion makes you have to think about it more to work it out in your mind why she does that. And so that's not mindfulness, okay? Um, Mindfulness is when the thought comes through is to observe it, to see it, see it as it is without judgment. To literally just observe it as you're observing my hand and to let it be as it is until it's nat it runs its natural course and just naturally falls away. Very gentle process. And then to go into the body and feel whatever was connected to that feeling, uh, connected to that thought, and just let that be as it is from an observe, uh, observing, non-judgmental way. So it's really like, it's acceptance in microcosmic form. You know, it's, it's not like um, saying, I accept all of you people, or I accept what's going on in my life, or I accept that my mother is this way. It's not like that. It's observing the thought, each thought coming and going and letting it be exactly as it is, and resting in that space that remains. There's a space that remains here, an awareness that's always here. It's sometimes called presence, sometimes called non-dual awareness or whatever, but there's an es sometimes called essence or um, in the old text they would call it the divine or, or whatever. But there's a sense of always being here, always being awake and aware, and all the stuff in your mind is simply stuff coming and going. It's just temporary stuff coming and going. But what remains is that essence, that core essence of who you are. And it's not something that you can intellectually understand. And that's why I think some therapists have difficulty with it, 
because you know, within, you know, even being an addiction counselor, going to school for that, you, you learn a lot of concepts, but this is not a concept you can understand. You have to experience. This is experiential. So one of the best ways that I like to explain it is like, when my, do like my dogs, I leave them at home all day because I go to work. And when I come home, you know, or I can imagine even when I'm gone, they're just sitting there. Just looking at this, smelling that, being. They're not, unless they've been around humans too much, they're not particularly bored. You know, if they are, they don't have, the thought doesn't attach or whatever it is, it doesn't attach. They're just there. And they're there in the moment, like the, the metaphor of the Zen dog or the Zen cat, right? Um, it's that sense of being that I think that humans have lost touch with. Just the experience of being. And also being okay with being. You know what I mean? It's not, because we're all being here, right? What do you mean being? We're being. No, I mean being like internally, stably, okay with just being here. Just right here. Um, and which means more and more less of the stuff up here. That's what happens with mindfulness. Less of like, oh my God, what does she think about me? Oh, what happened yesterday? What's going to happen tomorrow? I'm so worried about this. And no, oh, I hate my mother sometimes. Less of that and more just being. Um, so, so mindfulness definition would just be, from one sort of pure organic definition, would just be the practice of observing thoughts, emotions, and sensations, or being present to, to, to the moment as it is. It's one way of talking about it. Um, not something that you can understand. You can, you can write a whole treatise on it. You can write a book on it and still never get it. And that's the tricky thing about it. When I was in school, the ultimate of mental health was being in the here and now. So like the ultimate of being in the here and now. Yeah. Before mindfulness came out. Yeah. But isn't this the same thing? Well, but when you say before mindfulness came out in the West, because mindfulness is thousands of years old. But yes, I would assume that that, yes. Before mindfulness hit the West, right? Because in the East, when they hear you say, they'd be like, what is he talking about? Like, it, you know, before it came out. Like, it's been out for a, a long, long time. But um, yes, it's like living in the here and now. Right. And I would think that, that, in my view, that would be the goal, but I'm a little bit biased, of all good therapies. Because this is where reality is, this moment. And so to be stably present in this reality, in the vivid reality of this moment, here and now, awake and aware to what's here, to what you feel, to what you think, would, would to me be a sign of really good mental health. So yeah, that's probably what they were. Yeah, I wonder what decade was that? Like, was that in the 60s, by any chance? Yeah, well, it was, actually. I, I, I graduated psychology, so it was just you know, part of the curriculum. Was all these studies. Yeah. I knew that I could never attain it. Oh, yeah, sounds good here and now. Yeah, right. Who could ever be there? Yeah, right. There and here and now, that's just amazing. Yeah, right, that's the cha right challenge of it. Yeah, that, you, that's the million dollar question. You just hit the nail on the head because with addiction, because we haven't talked about that yet, it's all about getting out of the now, escaping the now. But, but, that's, but that really makes the point that mindfulness is really the answer. Because if we, can't, if we can train people to be more in the here and now, there's just going to be less future seeking for that next fix, just as a matter of math, simple logic. If addiction is, is about getting to the next moment, or the next high or escaping from what you feel now, then mindfulness, where you allow everything to be as it is in the moment, would be a natural antidote to that. But when you, when you ask the question, how, I think that it takes for therapists themselves to have a deep and solid practice. Because you have to come from this place in order to help other people come from this place. With, with some other therapies, you can learn sort of the protocol and the different steps of it and sort of work through those steps and even get really good at that. 
But with mindfulness, if you don't embody that yourself, if you don't come from that place, then clients can feel that. They can sense that you're not even coming from the place that you're, that you're asking them to come to. So I think one of the things with, and one of the things I think therapists need to do who are interested in this is they need to pick up their own practice of this with somebody who's well trained and understand the mechanics of it and practice it. And then what, what, what an amazing thing happens there in a mindfulness, a mindfulness session is that the therapist is then sort of holding the space for it all. In some ways, the therapist, a good mindfulness therapist, doesn't do a whole lot. Because what they're doing is that they're vulnerable themselves. They're there open to their own feelings that are coming through. They're observing even their own judgments or their own wanting to kind of fix. You know, that whole thing of wanting to fix people doesn't, you know, is something that a good therapist will become aware of. And if, and if one of the greatest things I've ever learned in, in those 10,000 people that I work with, one of the greatest things to do for them was nothing other than to be the space, hold that space of awareness for them so that they understand that no matter what comes up, it's okay. Like that's okay, and that thought is okay, and this feeling is okay if you'll sit with it, and then that feeling is okay if you'll sit with it. And can you see that thought? And how about that thought? And what you're teaching them is to really relate differently to their own experience. You're not trying to inject something into it, a protocol or anything. You're actually stepping back and holding the space and gently guiding them to be with their experience. But you have to have that yourself. And I think that's the challenge. When I'm looking for therapists for either of the companies that I work for, I would not hire a therapist that can't hold that space, who doesn't have some sort of a practice of their own. Yeah. Um, one thing the gentleman said over here is that in terms of not going back to the past and the future, but with, with our approach, we say that everything happens in the now, so even the past. Right? The past and the future are actually, how do we experience the past and the future except through thoughts and feelings and sensations that are arising now? How, how do you know that when you were 10 years old, somebody made fun of you? How do you know it? You think about it. And where does the thought appear? It appears right here, right now. And if you have a feeling with it, where does that appear? Right here, right? So in some sense, with mindfulness, Everything is on the table because everything happens here, um, even the, the revisiting of the past. But I think the, the, the distinction that the gentleman was making is that with some therapies, you kind of go back, you take people back into the, the past in a way that isn't mindful. So you're taking them back in almost to relive it. And sometimes if you're not careful, re-traumatize somebody because you, you, you don't, you know, that happens sometimes. With mindfulness, you're, ask, you're, ask, you're asking them to observe the thought and to learn how to get space between you and the thought and the memories and then learn how to come down into the body and really feel the, what is connected to that thought so that you're, you're, you're aware of all of that happening. And then that's, even though that's going back to the past, it's happening now and you're, and you're helping them heal through it by letting them be in the now with these thoughts of past and future. Um, there's all sorts of different techniques in mindfulness. I just want to talk about the ones that we do at our center. Um, and before I say that also, so, you know, when people, so I love the story of Buddha, right? Buddha, all he did, it wasn't, a, he didn't have a methodology, right? He didn't go and study, I mean, he, he, did, he met a lot of teachers, meditation teachers, whatever, but frankly, he didn't have much to say about the ones that he met. And what he did is he sat under a tree and he just sat there, and he watched everything coming towards him. Like all the thoughts of the demons and the seductive women or, and then all this stuff, the violence, the regret, the remorse, the shame, everything, the anger. And he sat there stably aware of everything coming and going, and then he just realized as, it, as he was allowing everything to come and go, every feeling, every thought, he just remained aware of it. He realized it just peters out after a while, and as it petered out, he just stood there, or he sat there, completely awake and aware to the moment, recognizing it was much like a dream. And it was like waking up out of the dream. That's why they call it waking up in the East, awakening, is it's a literal sense, that you literally wake up from the ego mind. So at the highest levels of, in, of, of mindfulness, there's a powerful enlightenment experience that's very transformative in the way that Buddha 
But the people that come off the street, you know, off heroin and stuff, you know, you can't expect that to happen. What, what happens in the beginning is giving them, in our center, is giving them some tools to help them with everyday practical stuff so that they can start to unhook themselves from cravings, withdrawal, anxiety, self-worth issues. We're not trying to reach Buddhahood <laughs> in the first 30 days or anything like that. But just at the higher levels of the practice, it's very, very transformative. Entire religions were built in the East around uh, those experiences. One thing that I really love about, there's a lot of things I really love about mindfulness. One is the vulnerability aspect, which is, I want to get into that more later. Uh, I, think, I think I'll hold off on that, but the vulnerability means um, when you feel something, is to come down into the body and just feel it, almost like to be curious about the visceral energy of it. Like, because normally what we do is like, if I'm sad, we'll say, I'm sad. Well, what are you sad about? Well, I'm sad because my mother did this. Well, okay, and then you think more about why it makes you sad and you stay sad. That's not a very conscious way to be with sadness. You know, because what you're doing is you're retelling a story that triggers a feeling of sadness. And then you go back into the mind to re-trigger the story or understand it, which kind of keeps the feeling there. And then you try to wonder, how, how can I get out of this somehow, right? Maybe I can forgive her, whatever. Not to say that that doesn't happen. It does work sometimes. But with mindfulness, what you say is that if you're sad, be sad. But be sad mindfully. So what is, what is sadness? When you, when you pull all the stories away from it, when you pull the labels of what mom did, and you, pulling away just means observe them. Let them be there. Oh, mom said this. Oh, there's her face of judgment. Um, oh, there's, you know, that reminds me of some, some, somebody said when I was 10 years old. You're watching all those thoughts, but then what you get down to is a core energetic feeling in the body. That's really what the sadness is. It's, an, it's a body thing. And what's amazing is when you peel those thoughts away, it's okay. It happens. Um, <laughs> When you peel those thoughts away, you get down just to the core sadness. And if, and if you can just sit with the sadness in, a spa in the space of the present moment and just let it be itself, like let it be as it is, what happens with that is that it falls away. Because everything in our reality falls away. Our whole reality is temporary. This is the whole teaching of impermanence. There's nothing that remains. Even this chair is disintegrating over time. Everything here is disintegrating over time, not just our bodies, the buildings, the trees, but all of our thoughts and emotions and sensations. To live in alignment with reality is to allow all of that to be as it is, to let every feeling just be as it is and then move through, to let every thought be observed and just let, let it be as it is, which is a natural thing. That's what it means to really accept reality, isn't it? I mean, think about when addicts don't accept reality. What they do is that a thought comes through and they don't allow that to just be. And what they do is they grab onto it and, they, and then they, I say, I want that to be different, right? Or I want whatever that thought is referring to, I want that person to be different. And they're fighting against that. So with mindfulness, we just say, that thought is there. Allow that to be as it is by observing. That's, that's the acceptance. Just allow it to be. When you take mindfulness deeper, it's, a, it's about an identity shifting. Um, I'm going to say more about the vulnerability in a second, but it's about shifting identity. And what do I mean by that? When I was doing those thousands of Skype sessions through the years, what I was noticing was that everybody has a deficiency story, or two or three. And a deficiency story is I'm not good enough, I'm a victim, I'm not loved, I'm not adequate, um, I'm weak, I'm powerless, I'm not safe, I'm not supported, I'm not heard, I'm not acknowledged, I'm not valid, I'm invalid. Those, those are just common things we hear in psychology a lot. 